Okay, well, we can go ahead and get started. Um, I see there's 93 participants and growing, which is awesome turnout. So thank you everybody for taking the time out of your day. Um, <clears throat> as you all know, we are holding webinar one, which is a series of several webinars to talk about developing a MODIS network in the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert. Um, my name is Mo Carell. I work for Bird Conservancy of the Rockies and I'm a landscape ecologist, but I also head up our full annual cycle science program for grassland birds. Um, and we have several co-hosts online with us today. Um, so including myself, we also have Matt Webb, who's our MODIS coordinator for the Great Plains. I um, mean, also for the Western US through Birds Canada, which is a jointly funded position. Um, we also have Aaron Strasser, who is heading up our MODIS efforts in Northern Mexico and the Southwestern US for the wintering grounds for grassland birds. And we also have Aaron Youngberg, who's kind of a Jill of all trades and is um, learning to set up our MODIS stations across our region of interest and is also helping um, on the administrative side of this webinar. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to privately message her um, for specifics about the webinar. All right, so what we plan to cover today is quite a bit, um, but I, I know we can get through it. First and foremost, Youngberg will talk to us briefly about webinar housekeeping. Um, I'll go over a quick introduction um, for Bird Conservancy's efforts um, in the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert. Then we're heal we'll hear from Stuart McKenzie um, talking about what it is MODIS generally. Um, and then we'll hear from several guest speakers talking about existing regional MODIS efforts that are already um, in the phases of implementation. So we're a couple years behind them and we're hoping to learn from what they've already done, including Lisa Kijuk, Sarah Kendrick, William Blake, and Mary Whitfield. Um, then we'll talk a little bit more in depth about what we plan for the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert um, through Bird Conservancy and this collaborative effort. And then we'll um, go through discussion, including a round robin, which I think is a really important part of this first webinar where everyone will have the chance to introduce themselves, talk about the interest, um, interest area or study area that they are currently working in, um, or just say, hey, I'm here to learn more about your organization and um, this collaborative effort. Then we'll go over spatial prioritization. So how we plan to move forward um, in putting up MODIS stations in the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert, and then talk about um, briefly funding opportunities that are coming up and next steps for our series of webinars. Um, so uh, with that, I will move to our first bullet, which is webinar housekeeping. Youngberg, take it away. Thanks, Mo. Um, I just want to remind everybody to uh, please keep yourself muted um, until the introductions later that will happen in the webinar as Mo mentioned and then um, please turn on your video if you can we want to see your shining faces and also with that if the display name on your screen is not your name because you might be using somebody else's uh, link or computer uh, please rename that so that when we do introductions Mo can call you by your name um, and to do that, at the bottom where it says participants, you can expand that, find yourself, and hover over your name and click on the more, and there should be an option to rename yourself. Um, also, we wanted to let you know that this is being recorded for later reference uh, or to share with others um, who were not able to attend today, or if you want to go back and just watch it again. And also, if you have any questions at all, please put those in the chat box and I'll monitor that. And if I find common questions or themes, I will pull those over so that we can address those during the discussion time. And we'll try to get to all of those um, at the end. So I think that's it. Thank you all for being here. Awesome, thanks, Erin. We have two Erins on our team, so they often go by their last names, Youngberg and Strasser. So that's what's going on to <laughs> say their last names instead of their first. Okay, so just to jump right into it and kind of why we're starting up this MODIS collaborative. Um, at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, we have a focus on um, grassland birds and birds of the um, Intermountain West. And as most of you on this call already know, grassland birds are in steep decline. Um, Lots of birds are declining across North America, but grassland birds are the guild that are declining the most quickly and have suffered some of the most severe losses. Um, grassland birds in North America, we also know, congregate in the Northern Great Plains, um, as well as the Chihuahuan Desert and Southwestern US um, during the wintering grounds, sorry, the, in the Northern Great Plains during the breeding season. 
Um, and so these areas are really important to concentrate on for um, bird conservation and to lessen declines for grassland birds. Um, we actually know a fair bit about what birds are doing during the breeding season and we have growing knowledge about what they're doing um, during the wintering season as well through some of Erin Strasser's work, which I'm sure she'll mention a little bit later. Um, but we really, there's a big question mark that still exists during um, grassland bird migration. We don't know where they're going. Um, we don't know how, how they're using stopover habitat and um, we don't know the timing of any of that movement or we have very um, limited knowledge about the timing of that movement. You're looking at a map here of a geolocator track that we recovered from a Baird Sparrow. A couple years ago, we put out over 200 geolocators on Baird Sparrows and Grasshopper Sparrows in the Northern Great Plains at three sites in Canada and the US. And we only recovered 12, um, which is kind of a testament to how nomadic these species really are. We just didn't see a lot of returns. Um, the ones that we did observe, we were able to capture, but um, there were, just weren't many returning to the same places where we deployed these tags. So, um, you know, I was showing you this slide just to show that really we don't know a lot about where they're going. And this geolocator track is some of the best knowledge that we do have, at least for the Baird Sparrow, as to what they're doing during migration. So we need to fill these knowledge gaps um, to help conserve these birds. And we're not the only ones who think this. This is um, a conservation plan penned by Scott Summershoe and I believe late 2018, along with a lot of other authors, um, kind of outlining a conservation strategy for four grassland bird specialists, um, which you can see pictured here. And I think that's Scott's hand actually, because we poached this from, from Facebook. Um, but in this really comprehensive document, it shows and outlines the fact that we don't know much about the migratory ecology for these birds. Um, and specifically, it recommends as a high priority conservation action for all four species to develop a MODIS um, wildlife tracking system across their ranges to understand more about what they're doing. So a lot of you are probably familiar with this um, shapefile as well. These black dots show all of the um, active MODIS stations currently in um, North and South America. We got this last week from the MODIS um, website. And as you can see, both in the breeding season and the non-breeding season, there's kind of a big gap when it comes to active MODIS stations. Um, there's not a lot going on in this area. And so we're hoping to change that with some of our efforts. Um, so we formed a little team at Bird Conservancy to um, forward a collaborative MODIS network. We have Matt Webb, Aaron Youngberg, Aaron Strasser, Brant, Ryder, who's our science director and is um, also administrating um, this webinar, and then myself. Um, and all five of us have gotten together and are um, moving forward with preliminary efforts to develop MODIS and, you know, this series of webinars, which will really get the ball rolling um, collaboratively across the region. So here's our general area of interest, and you'll see this map several times before the end of the webinar. Um, this was built um, using bird conservation regions um, developed by NAPSI or NAPKI. Um, and again, you see the existing MODIS stations overlaid on there. Um, so we're really hoping to develop this um, area with and put a lot more MODIS stations out in the next couple of years. So with that, I can hand it off to Stu, who can tell us a little bit more about what MODIS actually is and a little bit of the history there, um, and then we'll move forward on the presentations. Thanks, Stu. Okay. Hi, everybody. Can I get some of a some kind of a hands up or an indication that you can hear me okay? Thumbs up works, thanks. Is anybody finding these things getting any less awkward? <laughs> me neither. Okay, uh, so thank you very much uh, for inviting me today and for everybody's efforts in the Great Plains. Uh, I'm Stu McKenzie, the Director of Migration Ecology at Birds Canada, and one of my tasks is to um, try and wrangle MODIS, um, and uh, well, that, that's it. So the sort of the overview of my talk today is working collaboratively, collaboratively to cover more ground, which is more or less the, that's really the philosophy behind MODIS. Come on. Uh, so I'm going to skip over sort of why we need to track birds. Mo will cover that quite well. And I just wanted to stress, I always try and stress that tracking technologies are complementary. There is no holy grail. Um, we need to choose the best tool for the job. And ultimately what we want to do is try and to combine all the knowledge we can get from all our various technologies into that, um, into to best inform our knowledge and action for migratory birds. Now, MODIS is based on sort of traditional radio telemetry. 
and uh, but with a collaborative or a cooperative twist. Um, generally, radio telemetry offers the smallest available devices um, of any of the technologies with the exception of RFIDs. So we're down to less than 0.2 grams now for some models. They're battery or solar powered. Um, they allow for continuous monitoring of a station. Apologies, it's a <laughs> single parent. They can come say hi if they want. <laughs> They're somewhat occupied. We'll see how that goes. Uh, the stations allow for continuous monitoring of the, the tags. In some instances, each antenna on a tower can detect an animal from 10 to 20 kilometers aloft. Um, that shrinks significantly when birds are on the ground, especially in a grassland environment. Um, extremely high temporal precision. You can get information on the tags and the birds every time a tag beeps. Uh, so potentially every five seconds for, for some tags. There's no need to recapture a bird as the station's monitoring them continuously. Um, and then mm -hmm. very important is that we have central data management, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, um, and multiple technology partners, which are helping us to, to sort of drive um, this whole thing. So uh, overall, just sort of re to repeat, MODIS is a collaborative research network that uses coordinated automated radio telemetry to facilitate the research and education on the ecology and conservation of migratory animals. So if anybody asks you what MODIS is, that's what MODIS is, uh, and we're uh, sort of doing our best on that front. Come on. Sorry, I'm having a, my computer's having a, head, getting a headache here. Okay, um, we've recently upgraded some of our resources, uh, so you can sort of check that out on the website. It's sort of updating constantly for information about, um, you know, what tags do I use, what uh, equipment is available, and those types of basic information. Um, an important clarification is MODIS currently supports uh, tags and technology from from two major providers, low-tech wireless and cellular tracking technologies. So if you hear someone talking about MODIS tags, it, it really is low-tech tags or CTT tags. And the receivers are either sensor gnomes, CTT sensor stations, or low-tech um, uh, SRX, the series of low-tech SRX receivers. And station costs, you're looking at, you know, two to 4K at the low end up to 10K if you want to get really crazy and have uh, some awesome towers in the landscape. And how MODIS worked, this is a series of towers across the Western Hemisphere from the southern tip of South America uh, all the way into coastal Nova Scotia. Um, and because of the central data management, anywhere a bird goes within the array, all that data gets back to the researchers and the, the owners of those stations. So I'm going to just let this Birds play and sort of do the, uh, the work for me for a bit. Their beauty and songs to surprise and fascinate us with their behavior to inspire us with amazing feats of strength and endurance. Some songbirds migrate thousands of kilometers every year in challenging conditions. Birds play critical roles in our ecosystems. They pollinate plants and spread seeds. They help control insects. Birds are also valuable indicators of change. Many populations have been seriously declining for decades. One third of North American bird species need urgent conservation action to avoid extinction. We have to act now to protect the habitats and systems that support all life on Earth. But how? Scientists must unlock the mysteries of migratory birds and study their movements on breeding grounds along migration routes and in wintering areas. The MODIS wildlife tracking system uses tiny tracking devices and a network of hundreds of receiving stations strategically located throughout the Western Hemisphere. MODIS is yielding spectacular discoveries. Now, researchers can safely track bird movements over vast distances and with incredible detail to pinpoint the greatest threats to vulnerable species. The results help us identify conservation priorities and direct efforts and funds for maximum impact. 
we have the power to make a big difference with your support. So I want to do apologies up front to anybody. There's a lot of repetition with what you may have seen at the recent North American Ornithological Congress, and there'll probably be uh, some of that uh, again uh, in the thing today with what we did on a round table and, and sort of what we're, what we're all working on in various forms is, is strategic development with respect to, uh, to MODIS and these sort of regional coordinations. Um, and, but what we're working toward is uh, obviously that the concept of greater conservation science, whether it be the basic discovery policy and management, public engagement and education, and then ultimately conservation action. The only thing I'll repeat here is that uh, MODIS is dependent on um, a centralized database uh, where all of our data, all of our metadata, all of our information is centralized and, and coordinated. Um, otherwise, the whole thing falls apart. <laughs> uh, and likewise, when we have uh, data from the database um, is freely available to all of the, the users that sort of own the data, um, but we also have made linkages available so that you can access uh, tools and use um, access your data through MoveBank. And there's also a public interface which makes some of the data um, publicly available. So this is sort of a, an extent of what the MODIS array looks like currently. So obviously a lot, most of our effort um, to date has been in the sort of eastern seaboard of the United States and into Central and South America, but there are very active nodes and participation in the, the North Sea and Northern Europe uh, and very active uh, work also happening in Australia. Uh, and uh, this is just sort of a prospectus on what the West might look like or is quickly starting to look like in the next year or two. And over the past five years, we've seen uh, quite a lot of, well, you could pretty much call it exponential growth. We're over to a 1.2, 1.3 billion records in the MODIS database, um, which is providing some other challenges as we, as we continue to grow. And by the numbers, collectively, we are operating in 31 countries, over 900 stations, and we've tagged over 24,000 individuals of more than 200 species. And there's hundreds of partners and collaborators working on this. So your efforts on the Great Plains um, will almost certainly uh, bolster all of these numbers. And we're, this is a little out of date. We're over 110 publications using MODIS data so far. Um, I think I'm almost probably out of or quickly running out of time. Um, so I'm going to skip over uh, the applications and sort of what MODIS does, assuming that a lot of us understand that, and we'll see a little bit more of it. Um, but you're going to get, uh, let's call it the crash course in MODIS, <laughs> where we can go from uh, very fine scale information about what birds are doing at, uh, at very localized landscapes and understand their temporal and behavioral decisions that they're doing on migration or during stopover. So when a bird is active or at rest and active and at rest and when they actually take flight and decide to fly and what direction they're going and how fast it took them to get there. And likewise, we can, as I said, we can determine based on which direction they're um, based on signal strengths and then the antennas they depart on, what direction they continue to decide to fly in. And as we scale up from the local environment, we can understand what they're doing in more regional scapes. And these are all Swainson's thrush leaving the north end of the Bruce Peninsula in southern Ontario. You'll notice a lot of them have tendency to do this little flip here. Um, and that's actually a lot of them following a major landscape feature, some of the only green space left in southern Ontario, which is called the Niagara Escarpment. We scale up once more and we can see and understand this is all using the same technology, the same tags, and then sometimes on the same individuals, how birds leaving Colombia are um, navigating uh, Central America. And in the case of gray cheek thrushes and gray here, crossing the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico, sometimes in a single bound. Um, and, uh, and then up upon arrival into the breeding grounds. And this has provided great insight into um, sort of the the hemispheric importance um, or the local importance of stopover on a hemispheric scale. Um, and I'll skip that little nuanced story <laughs> for another day. Um, and so just this is one example in a paper in Scientific Reports. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's very good showing that uh, the importance of a stopover site in northern Colombia um, is basically dictating the, the pace and um, the pace and the distance that great cheek thrushes um, are able to travel um, as they leave Colombia, crossing the Caribbean Sea and entering into to North America. So why I skipped past that so quickly is to talk a bit more about the meats and potatoes and some other stuff that we're working on that is 
freely available to anybody using Modus and that we can adapt and add to uh, regionally as needed. And that's the Modus Educator Guide, which has a bunch of case studies. Um, and we're beginning to populate a website with a more public user friendly interface where schools um, or nature centers can um, you know, have a station on, on their site and actually see what's being detected um, at any um, on their stations. And these types of tools are going to be sort of more readily integrated into the, the main MODIS interface. So there is more of that public outreach component um, and more direct feedback to, to landowners and our collaborators. Currently, the case studies are, are limited to only four species, but, um, you know, it doesn't take a lot to, uh, get, for instance, make one for Baird Sandpiper or make them sort of regionally significant. Um, MODIS is kind of the perfect example of community science. We have a community of, of researchers and collaborators working together sort of unbeknownst to one, one another. Um, I have a really hard time thinking of any publication that uses data only from their study site. Um, almost every project uses and integrates um, project and data collected by others. Um, and uh, it's collecting very important complementary information to all the other uh, technology that we already have. And just very briefly, as I sort of glossed over the, the concept of strategic planning, this is sort of um, relevance to what's going on in the, in the Great Plains in a paper recently published by Bianchini et al. Um, highlighted some key areas, at least for shorebird conservation within the Great Plains that would be um, important um, for MODIS coverage to fill some gaps. And we uh, were already working on the Shane Bottoms and someone on this call can probably comment on, on uh, the Great Salt Lake. But this is more, um, I don't want to bring attention to just those sites here. This is more a, a concept of the type of discussions that we could be having um, about prioritizing sites and locations for different species groups. And I think that'll be a discussion later on today. Um, MODIS is broken down into a number of different um, sort of categories that we all need to work on separately. And, and one is just the animals and the methods we use um, in our tracking. There's the whole infrastructure and maintenance and setup um, and technology development. There's an education and outreach, which is its own thing. Um, technology and infrastructure kind of overlap. There's the research actual projects and the cooperators, and then the overarching themes of conservation science. So MODIS is a, to put it succinctly, MODIS is a bear and we need to uh, sort of carve off all these, these pieces and work on them um, collectively. Uh, and that's what we're working on. So in terms of a strategic planning process, this meeting and other regional meetings like this are part of it. Um, so, uh, you know, if this was, we'll pretend this is part of a grand plan, a lot of this is happening organically, but I like to pretend it's all, you know, a master plan. So we're having all of these regional meetings and coordinations and consultations to build sort of champions around the world, essentially. Um, and then we'll start bringing in cross-regional meetings and collaborations and to work on these special working groups. Um, and within those groups um, that I talked about, uh, where like-minded people on education, for instance, can get together and discuss where we should go with that. Um, and then uh, we'll sort of progress, communicate, and repeat that cycle until the end of time. And uh, MODIS will thrive and make grand contributions to conservation science. So that's probably way more than my time. Um, I just want to thank you and most importantly, all of the collaborators and supporters. Um, I think I'll stop there and we can sort of carry on in questions or anything. Sorry for any interruptions and background noise. Um, at any time, if you have any questions, you can contact us at modus at birdscanada.org um, and then check out any of the um, sort of resources on the web, which are constantly being updated. And a very important resource is our discussion group. Um, where you can pose questions um, or discussions on various topics. And if you're not on, on that group already and are interested, I would suggest joining it because almost all of our correspondence um, from MODIS HQ with uh, the community is done through that discussion group. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. If there's anything that I left out, uh, Mo or Matt, um, just let me know and I can chime in now or I'll wait for questions or anything like that. So looking forward to the rest of the chat this afternoon. Yeah, I think um, if you have any questions, Youngbro might be about to say this too, you can add them to the chat box now, and then we'll have um, some time after all of our speakers have gone um, to address any kind of like common um, questions that are coming up. Yeah, no questions yet, but we did post that uh, website in there and um, the email that Stu mentioned, so you guys can so, check that in the chat as well. 
Last thing I'll, I'll mention, I mentioned the round table at the uh, North American Ornithological Congress. I don't know if we were allowed to, but we recorded it um, and it's posted on our website as well. Um, so you can follow up um, and get that broader perspective. And if you have any uh, yeah, questions about what it does, I'd suggest looking at the publications through the publications list and that really gives you the, the broadest perspective of what's possible. Great. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Stu. You didn't go too far over, so don't don't worry about that. <laughs> um, so next, we'll hear from some regional coordinators that have already gotten um, kind of collaborative modus efforts up and running in different parts of the continent. So first, we're going to go from east to west. Um, so we'll start with Lisa Kijuk, who's the director of bird conservation at the Woolstown Conservation Trust, and she'll be talking to us a little bit more about the Northeast Modus Collaborative. Oops. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm Lisa Kijuk. Thanks, Mo. Thanks, Stu. I, I remember a few years ago, Stu saying that Birds Canada wanted to be make MODIS the Google of bird conservation. <laughs> I don't know if he remembers that, but it, it kind of is the Google of bird conservation. It's uh, Birds Canada has done an incredible job to make this user-friendly and take something very complex like technology and wildlife tracking and, and make it accessible to so many different types of people and kinds of people and um, it's created a movement, a bird movement so to speak. And uh, we're just, oh, I'm always grateful to Birds Canada for, for the way they've, uh, for the way they manage all the data and all of these uh, pieces. I don't know how they keep it all together, but I'm happy that they do. Um, you know, we, we, this is the Northeast collaboration. It's, it's a funny cast of characters. Um, I'm with a local land trust, Williston Conservation Trust, who has a vibrant bird conservation program through our bird banding program. Um, and then we also partnered with uh, Scott Widensall from the Ned Smith Center for Nature and Art and Project. He's one of the founders of Project Alnet, along with David Brinker, founder of Project Alnet and uh, works for Maryland DNR. And then Luke DeGroat from uh, Powder Mill Nature Reserve. So we, we came together. Um, all of us were more interested in just looking at our own species. First one was uh, the Northern Sawwet Owl. But as we embarked on this project, it clearly became, it became clear that there was this geographic gap. So if we were going to do any work at all, we needed to fill in some of this space here. And if you go on the MODIS map now, you'll see that this is pretty, pretty well populated with MODIS stations. Um, so this is a, just a closer look. We realize that if you tag something, you know, in, in uh, Canada, it could actually go through the entire Northeast corridor without ever getting pinged. So uh, instead of just working on our own projects, we got a grant early on from the uh, Pennsylvania Game Commission to do it, the first statewide array. And that was the light bulb moment for us, I think, to say, oh, this is great. Anything that anyone's working on south or north of Pennsylvania is going to get tagged in Pennsylvania. Um, so that, that gave us the idea to then go further. And plus, all of a sudden, with that first statewide array, we got we got some attention from the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which was very lucky. Uh, so we we applied for the first competitive state wildlife grant to in, in, uh, install MODIS stations within the Mid-Atlantic. Um, and we used Jeff Bueller from University of Delaware's NEXRAD radar, weather radar data to kind of focus on where we wanted to put these lines of, of stations, um, red being the hotspots for migration stopover, um, and then the colors go down from there. So you can see the Mid-Atlantic, this is, this is our, our great plan in the beginning. Um, and, and currently we have, I'll show you this, this the, all the red dots are all the stations that we've put up. All these blue dots will turn red within the next two weeks. Um, and we will have a hundred stations that we've put up since 2017, which accounts for about 10% of the overall MODIS network which is pretty crazy to think that um, we did that because I it doesn't feel like we did it. <laughs> um, and then in the future, we also received a second competitive state wildlife grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to uh, populate stations throughout the New England states, uh, working with New, New Hampshire Audubon and, and all of the state agencies up there. 
So this is what it will look like in the next three years. So um, there's a lot of research opportunity. We, we've been building infrastructure and kind of delaying all of our species projects, but now we're actually gonna be able to take a break from this and start doing tagging projects, which is very exciting. Um, the COVID, the COVID shutdown was not great obviously for field work, but it did give us a chance to go through the data. And Luke DeGroat and Scott Widensall went through um, our data since 2017, 60 stations were in Pennsylvania and a little bit in Maryland and Delaware. We had 11 million detections. Uh, out of that was 1,525 individuals of birds, bats, and butterflies of 75 species. So that was pretty amazing to see all the different species using Pennsylvania. How the heck did we do this? Uh, it takes teamwork. And I think a lot of people keep saying, well, MODIS isn't really in my job description. Well, I'll tell you what, if you can fundraise, it becomes part of your job description really fast because your, your board then sees how much money is being allocated to each position. And it's been, and that's how we started. We, we started with little pieces being funded for MODIS. And now most of these positions are fully funded by the MODIS uh, donations that we get. So it's been really incredible without this diverse group of people with skill sets. Remember, these are all field biologists and some of them turned engineer on us. <laughs> and so you kind of need this, this diverse skill set in order to make everything work. Um, collaboration is the key. It started with just a private, a, a strong group of private funders who saw the vision that we saw. And then after we got a nice pile of money from those in private donors, it, it quickly turned into leveraging um, money from lots of the state agencies, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and a lot of different foundations. A lot of universities are able to conduct research projects because of this infrastructure that we built. So it, it, it grows the collaboration and the funding available for these projects. And even people that just own the land where a MODIS station is located, they also are collaborators and involved. And, and there, there is, they babysit our stations for us. So this is a way to leverage your, uh, your work. Um, the barriers to entry, of course, is the steep learning curve. If you told me five years ago I would be doing anything technology related, I would have laughed and laughed and laughed. But it's crazy, but here we are. Um, and it's a just, again, field biologists doing technology. It's, a, it's an interesting, once you climb the curve, it starts to become less, less scary. It is, it initially looks expensive, but once you start doing it, it's not as expensive as, as some other um, things. So, whoops, sorry. I think that the, the reasons we were successful was because it, we have the trifecta for funding streams. We, we are dealing with birds, which is wildlife. We're dealing with technology and education. And this appeals to so many different types of fund, funding uh, options, which we found. And I, so um, the keys to our success really are funding, dedication by our team, and the team working together. Again, I'm not good at, you know, putting up MODIS stations, but I'm good at fundraising and, and you know, running a banding station. And, and someone else might be good at different things. And you have to identify the strengths of each person. And then that person has to be given the freedom to do what works for them. And it, somehow it all comes together in a very powerful, passionate group of people. Um, and, and the collaboration. Uh, I think that's about it. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. It's great. It's nice to see all the different approaches to getting these things up and running. So um, next, we'll be hearing from Sarah Kendrick, who's um, not able to join us today, but she is heading up collaboration um, for a MODIS co cooperative kind of in the She's out of Missouri, but Matt, can you add a little bit more information about her region of interest? Yeah, Sarah Kendrick is the state ornithologist for the uh, state of Missouri, and she is also the chair of the Midwest Migration um, Group. I can't remember the name of them. <laughs> Midwest Migration Group. She's the chair for the telemetry working group on, on that. So she is a, a, a modus evangelist throughout the Midwest. And um, I'll just try to play her video here and let her speak for herself. All right, here we go. 
Hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Kendrick. I am the state ornithologist with the Missouri Department of Conservation. I'm so sorry that I can't be there with you live today. Um, we are reintroducing brown-headed nuthatches to the state, and I just had to be in the field to go try and get more. Um, I am also the telemetry group lead for the Midwest Migration Network. That's MidwestMigrationNetwork.org. Um, and we're a group of agencies, NGOs, and universities uh, working on collaboration and communication uh, for bird research across generally Fish and Wildlife Service Region 3. Um, in the telemetry group, we have focal research questions and focal species that you can find on our website. Um, I was asked by Matt to update you on Midwestern efforts for MODIS. So I'll give you a few updates. So in Missouri, we are planning and implementing two digital fences across the state, one in the northern half of the state and our glaciated plains or grassland portion of the state, and then another digital fence line beneath um, in our Missouri Ozarks. Um, and so um, we are working uh, diligently on that. We have eight receivers live in the southern line uh, we have seven on the way for the northern line. We are upgrading those to dual listening stations for CTT life tags and power tags in addition to low tech nano tags on the 166 frequency. Uh, we got a Fish and Wildlife Service Region 3 Migratory Birds grant a few years ago to place 12 new receivers in Missouri, Illinois, and Guatemala with a handful of partners both in the Midwest <clears throat> and internationally. We uh, here in the state are Missouri Conservation Heritage Foundation uh, with ABC uh, supported the placement of a receiver in Nicaragua on the El Jaguar Reserve. So along the lines you see here that we're not just trying to increase MODIS coverage in the Midwest, but also on stopover sites in the wintering grounds, since that's what we're trying to track. Um, our last update is that in June we applied uh, Missouri's lead on a competitive state wildlife grant which included about 12 other partners. It would place 59 new MODIS receivers in eight Midwestern states and three countries, Mexico, Costa Rica, and Colombia. It also supports three MODIS tracking research projects here in the Midwest, uh, tracking kestrels, golden warblers, uh, and placing 50 tags uh, on these tropical migrants down during spring migration on stopover sites as they move north to hopefully pass uh, our MODIS receivers up here. So that is a big effort and we're really trying to ramp up getting more receivers up in the region. I'm going to share my screen and show you um, what our plan is. So uh, I think I've presented about 12 to 15 times uh, to the public in Missouri trying to ramp up support, educate about MODIS and how cool it is and bird migration. And I would show this map. Um, which showed MODIS coverage about two years ago. And so I used to um, show you this circle and, oh, sorry, and say, so you may notice a gap. This is a big gap in the Midwest. Well, over the last two years, this many receivers have gone up. You can see how the coverage is a lot more widespread in the Midwest than it used to be. Um, and this is our Midwest Migration Network kind of pie in the sky plan for placing receivers across the Midwest. You can see most are latitudinal lines that cross state borders. We're really trying to ramp up collaboration across the whole region, across states. And then along our water uh, bodies of water. So along the Great Lakes, um, surrounding those, lots of different partners across the Midwest working on this uh, and along the Mississippi. So that's kind of our Midwestern efforts. Um, so our scope in the Midwest is both in the Midwest, but also on stopover sites in the wintering grounds. Um, we recently had a Midwest Migration Network virtual conference. If you just search those terms in YouTube, you can find our recorded sessions. And our telemetry group hosted speakers from across the Midwest who were using MODIS for different uh, research. And what we, what big takeaway from that was, is that you can use MODIS for local movements in addition to these hemispheric movements of our migrants. And so we have really good examples of that. So I encourage you to watch that um, if you're interested. We had a really good session with over 160 participants. So that was very nice to see that interest in MODIS. So lessons learned in the Midwest. MODIS is a learning curve, but it's not, an, uh, it's not one that's not easily, over, not easily overcome. It's a learning curve. But if I can do it, you can do it. I'm a biologist. My background is not in communications uh, or anything like that. But you will need to identify folks who can help you with the technical side of things. That will really help. Our IT a person in our agency grew up using ham radios. So if you can find someone like that who can key in on this older technology, really it's an older technology, MODISes, that's been uh, 
really uh, modified for today's use. And so it's it's just really neat how that is adapted um, to changing times. Um, another thing I've learned is that people, lay people will donate to this cause. So if you have a heritage foundation or some way to raise funds uh, through an NGO or something like that, we've raised about $20,000 in Missouri just from giving those presentations. Audubon chapters have donated generously individuals. Uh, people want to support this effort because it's a collaborative, it's wide scale, um, and it's just really neat. It touches on something like migration that seems almost miraculous. So uh, people, re it really resonates with people. I think it's been successful here in the Midwest because people get really excited about these projects. Um, in terms of how we collaborate and communicate, I'm really hoping to ramp that up in the future. Again, I'm the ornithologist. I can't do MODIS full time. It's only a small part of my job. I wish I could give more time to it. But we really hope to ramp up that collaboration and communication. Uh, I know that Stu at MODIS and the other folks at MODIS really want to do that, and I want to do that as well. So we're hoping to increase that. So I will stop sharing my screen, and I will thank you for your time. And again, I am sorry that I am not able to be there today. Uh, but best of luck um, coordinating and collaborating at your meeting. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Awesome. Well, thank you virtually um, to Sarah. That was really kind of an inspiring map to look at, I got to say, with all of those lines. I think we should just connect, keep connecting them across the GPCD. <laughs> um, but we can talk more about that later. So we're going to skip our region for now and move on to William Blake, who is the avian biologist at MPG Ranch. And he's going to talk to us more about collaborative efforts in the Intermountain region. Hi, everyone. I'm Connect right here. All right. I'm going to try to stay under three minutes. <clears throat> so I am the coordinator for the Intermountain West Collaborative Modus Project, um, but I work as a wildlife biologist, excuse me, um, for MPG Ranch. MPG Ranch is located in western Montana. And we're a big restoration and conservation ranch of about 30,000 acres. And most of the work I do with MODIS is so, solely funded through our, our main funder at MPG. Um, the uh, Intermountain West Collaborative Project aims to tag as many birds and bats for the current research with many collaborators in Montana at MPG Ranch, um, but also to expand um, the MODIS network out in the Rocky Mountain region in the Western US and also to provide the support um, in the development of MODIS to other collaborators in this region. When we started, uh, there was a big gap in the, in the Rocky Mountains. And as of last week, um, I installed for this year, uh, the 21st um, operational MODIS station. Um, we have one spanning all the way to Wisconsin on our funders property, but focusing on the West um, here in green, I will be going and installing five more uh, in partnership with um, Andy Boyce uh, at the Smithsonian and um, Apricot Mains Farm in California and then Intermountain Bird Observatory, uh, Jay Cardell and Jeremy Halka. The idea for the next couple of years would be to create fences along um, our existing network to connect Oregon to Idaho, um, work with uh, Scott Summershoe and Matt Webb and Andy Boyce to try to go across the state and Allison Begley in Montana, um, potentially connecting all those networks to have a both a network of latitudinal fences, uh, connecting corridor uh, networks, but also having uh, potential um, species targeted projects, such as uh, a potential initiative with partners in flight on Lewis's woodpeckers. Then another aspect that MPG is trying to fund is help all neotropical migrant researchers get more tags uh, tag detections, and so with Mary Whitfield and Partners in Flight folks, we're trying to locate um, this area and the narrowing of southern Mexico to put to establish a fence um, 
so that potentially all the neotropical migrants continentally um, or mig migrating continentally would be able to get picked up. Um, so we have four potential sites with the local uh, Mexican hosts that would be willing to, to host a MODIS station and take care of it. And we're looking for more um, in that area. I think really simply the best method, I'm over my three minutes. Um, the best methods for success are really just, in my opinion, the exposure with time, um, your accrued experience. You're going to have many learning curves and lots of setbacks, and there's no way around that. Um, and getting MODIS stations up, installed, and operational, um, it's, it's incredible how many people will contact you if you have MODIS stations in their area and they're interested in joining your project. Um, I wrote an entire list, call it a, a mini guidebook on all the things you could do right and wrong. And so I don't think there's much need for me to talk about all these different points, um, but all these uh, successful lessons I've learned, I'd be happy to share with you. Um, and same, as far as collaborating, hosting plat platforms like Zoom, are very important. Um, I share all my Google Drives and other repositories with collaborators. The, the most sensor GNOME Google discussion groups have been really, really awesome, um, especially for analysis. Um, if I have any questions regarding how to get into R and how to, mod to analyze my data, um, those Google discussion groups have been good. And that's it for me. Awesome, thanks William. Yay. Um, all right, last but not least, we have Mary Whitfield, who is the research director at the South Sierra Research Station and also heads up the Western Working Group for Partners in Flight um, for MODIS. Um, so Mary's gonna talk to us a little bit more about um, Pacific Coast um, collaborative efforts for MODIS. Hi everyone, let me get my talk up. All right, can everyone see that all right? All right, perfect. Okay, for those of you who don't know, uh, the uh, Partners in Flight Western Working Group is made up of Western Canadian territories and provinces, US Western states, and Western states in Mexico. Uh, we meet twice a year and bring together federal, state, and NGOs um, for, from all three countries. Um, all of our working group meetings are open to anyone interested in bird conservation, and all are welcome. And I'll post a, um, a link to the Partners in Flight uh, website later on. So um, we the basic um, goals of the project are to stimulate migration research in the West, uh, provide better information to assess threats, identify important migratory stopover sites, and to increase public interest in, in migratory wildlife. Um, you'll notice that scale, it's, fair, it's pretty ambitious, but I think we can do it. So uh, what we've done is we've put together a, a prospectus on partners that can uh, that partners can use and give funding agencies to use as uh, support to fund their project. Um, we have a MODIS subcommittee with over 40 participants, um, and so what we're trying to do is help coordinate projects to avoid duplication. And we have a spreadsheet and map to visualize current and future stations. Um, so basically my role is to work with people to help coordinate these projects in the West. So I'm currently working with uh, Matt and William to um, work on our coordination efforts and exchange ideas. Um, and we currently use a, a listserv, uh, Partners in Flight does, a Western Working Group, to, a listserv to keep in touch. We have meetings. Um, the MODA subcommittee has a Google Drive folder to share information, and um, basically our funding strategies have been highly variable. And here's an example of the uh, map we have on the Southern Sierra Research Station website, and 
This is based off a, a spreadsheet that we have in Google Drive where we ask people to put in potential and future MODIS stations and also ones that are operating. It obviously needs to be updated. William's done a lot of work, so um, a lot of those stations aren't on there, so we'll have to update, update that. And um, I'll provide a link to that um, Google Drive spreadsheet. So if you guys have um, basically stations that are you're planning to or you have funding for, if we can get those on there, that would be really helpful. And this is an interactive map, so you can click on dots and get information on some of those future stations, and that way you can find potential collaborative partners. So uh, here's a really small list of some of the uh, projects that we have going on, and um, that tricolor blackbird one, I think we Currently, it's just in the Kern River Valley in California, but I think this would be a great species to get um, a bunch of MODIS stations up the center of California and even into the coast and desert areas a little bit. So I think that could be a potentially a really good project. Um, Matt's already talked about Great Plains and um, Lewis's Woodpecker, Williams talked about that. And uh, for a Northwestern MODIS, there's a, currently, um, I think Julian's in on this call, in this webinar, but um, they uh, have a grant in place and it's gonna involve a training workshop uh, shop and 15 to 18 stations at 11 sites in, in Northwestern Mexico. And they're hoping to track about 200 shorebirds of six species. So some of the lessons learned, I think uh, William touched on that a little bit. Um, already. Uh, it's really important to coordinate to avoid duplication, whether that's duplication in stations and, and or contacts, and to also answer questions from interested participants as soon as possible. Um, right now, you could. this is a MODIS site here, in the, one of them in the Kern River Valley. Um, this is a new one in Nicaragua that was just put up last week. It, it should be up and running, I think, by the end of this week. Um, and we'll have two more in Nicaragua to help um, track on the Pacific coast to help track uh, migrants. So that's pretty exciting. Um, some other things I could also, for lessons learned, is order your equipment early, especially this year. Um, it can take longer than you may think sometimes to get um, equipment in. Um, and also stations will usually take longer to set up than you originally planned. So if you plan one day to set up a station, you, you might, you think it may only take one day, plan out two just in case. Um, and basically, you know, join us if you can. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so next up, we have Matt Webb and Aaron Strasser, who are going to talk a little bit more about um, the GPCD, or Great Plains Chihuahua Desert um, Modus Collaborative. Matt, you are up first. Mary, if you could stop sharing your screen. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. My name is Matt Webb, and I just want to talk to you about our plans for expanding the MODIS network across the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert. So as Mo had explained earlier, uh, the grassland birds are experiencing some of the steepest declines of any avian guild. Um, we want to fill in some of the knowledge gaps within this region, the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert, which is shown here represented by the uh, range map of the Baird Sparrow, one of those grassland birds experiencing really steep population declines. Uh, we're particularly interested in identifying stopover locations that grassland birds utilize during their migratory season. We wanna understand some more information about migratory timing. We wanna look at and understand what specific habitat birds are using during migration. Outside of the migratory season, there are some season-specific questions that we can get at using MODIS, uh, learning about where the birds go after uh, breeding, and also kind of trying to get at understanding this bizarre um, 
nomadic movement that the birds exhibit during uh, the winter. So this is that geography that we keep talking about. Um, as you can see, there are a few, but not a lot of existing moda stations in this region, which makes it pretty difficult to understand or to answer some of these specific questions that we're interested in. So all of these black dots on this map are existing moda stations, and it would be really good for us to understand what it is that makes up a moda station as we talk about these. So essentially, each of these moda stations compri is uh, comprised of antennas uh, connected via cables to a station computer, and that station computer is powered through some kind of existing power or solar power on site. And then there is a, uh, a way to connect the data that is collected at that station with MODIS's servers. So um, sometimes they're connected to internet or uh, cellular coverage is, is uh, present on site as well. And there are three options uh, for the station computer or receiver. The sensor station, as you see here, uh, is made and uh, sold by Cellular Tracking Technologies, or CTT. Uh, Low-Tech makes a receiver that works with tags. And then there is a receiver called a sensor gnome, and you can purchase this pre-built from several places, but you can also build your own. And so these MODA stations can feel fairly uh, complex and daunting when you get down and look at all of the different components, um, especially for us as biologists, as everybody has said so far. But we will be holding workshops throughout the region where participants can come and learn about MODIS, uh, learn how to build and maintain a MODIS station, how to troubleshoot the station uh, when issues do come up. You'll get a list of uh, equipment to order. There are a lot of different pieces, uh, depending on the specific questions that you might have. And so you'll walk away with a, uh, a complete list with um, website addresses and everything of what to order and uh, where to order them. And the most important part is you'll learn from our experiences what not to do. So at Bird Conservancy, we've gathered funding for about 40 stations to be placed across this region, the GPCD. And we wanna place these stations in an intentional and collaborative manner. And we wanna do that in order to benefit as many different projects that uh, are operating across this region as possible. So we have begun to place a few stations within this region and tag a few birds using some funding that we received from US Fish and Wildlife Service to test MODIS equipment in a grassland ecosystem. So on this map, I will zoom in on uh, the state of Colorado and show you uh, the two stations that we have up and running so far. Uh, one at Soapstone Prairie Natural Area, which is on the uh, border of Wyoming and Colorado, and one down at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge just outside of Denver. We have plans to install at least four more stations associated with this testing project um, at locations that are determined or have yet to be determined. Uh, two of those we hope to have on uh, two towers owned and operated by the National Ecological Observatory Network, or NEON. NEON is a network of towers across the United States uh, that collect a bunch of different kinds of environmental data. And um, essentially they're working to measure climate change in real life. These towers of NEONs have uh, really great existing infrastructure, including power and internet on site, which would make them ideal for uh, MODIS stations. So also another part of this testing project is to use uh, the drones that we have here at uh, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies to test the effectiveness, uh, the effective range of the antennas on these stations. So we're gonna put tone, uh, tags on, these, on the drone and fly them at known distances away from these antennas, really to try to understand how far we can detect birds um, within this grassland ecosystem. As part of this, we'll also be placing tags on birds, um, on grassland birds to understand how effective the tags are within the grassland vegetation. Grassland birds are unique in that they're um, constantly in contact with their habitat. And that constant contact uh, causes uh, much more rapid wear 
and we're interested to find out if that where will reduce the lifespan of these tags or make them um, uh, work in different ways. We're also interested to see how well these solar panel tags uh, work as the birds are foraging underneath the grass. For more information on this drone testing project, you can contact Erin Strasser, and there's her email, erin.strasser at birdconservancy.org. So as we're placing these stations across a landscape, it really will help to understand in the GPCD region, what makes a great location for a MODA station. Um, I'm gonna use the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge station here as an example because it really has um, all of these components um, on site there. The arsenal has a pre-existing structure. We were able to use this communications tower uh, connected to this building uh, to put our antennas at a nice height in the air. There's lots of people on site at the uh, Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge, which gives us the ability to keep an eye on the station, uh, let us know what's going on with it, if there are any kind of weather events that cause damage to it. Also, there's resources for regular maintenance on site. We have a, uh, a long-term existing relationship with uh, the landowners of this as well. There is a, uh, an existing MOU between Birds Canada and the National Wildlife Refuges Program to do MODIS on refuges pro uh, um, properties throughout uh, the United States. More infrastructure that exists here is uh, on-site internet and power, and those really, really help to um, get data to the MODA servers without a technician having to visit and pull the data and download it themselves and upload it to the servers. And that on-site power also makes it so that we can have this site up year round. So based on some of our funding that we received through the National Fish and Wildlife Federation or Foundation, um, sorry, <laughs> we developed this phased approach to build out the MODIS network in the region. Uh, we have a three-phased um, approach over the next five years is our, is our rough time frame. We're within phase one right now. Um, we're going to be building off of existing partnerships that Bird Conservancy has from previous grassland bird um, work throughout the entire region, developing new partnerships uh, through presentations and webinars such as this, We'll be hosting some webinars like this one that you're on and other ones to continually plan out this whole building process. Um, we'll be hosting some MODIS workshops throughout this time and throughout all three parts of our phase for the next five years, we'll be building MODIS stations across the region and tagging birds. And so I just want to end with, end my portion real quick with, uh, my ideas of regional modus, modus collaboration. These four bullet points are kind of my, my main thoughts of what it means to collaborate. There's opportunities for collaborative funding. Uh, there's opportunities for partner landowner relationships or property that a partner owns for station maintenance and hosting. Uh, potential for partner funded station builds and installations. And then I always want us to keep in mind this idea of research collaboration. Do our research questions or our study sites overlap in some way? So with that, I will turn it over to Aaron Strasser to talk more about the Chihuahuan Desert portion of our project, especially as it relates to Mexico. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me? Good, all right. So um, yeah, as Matt said, I'm gonna talk about uh, MODIS in international grasslands, um, some of the opportunities and challenges related to that. It's really unique that um, this network is going to be implemented in grasslands across North America in, in three countries, the US, Canada, and Mexico. Um, and so uh, I just want to mention first and foremost that we we currently have funding from uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act to get um, to, to do planning uh, to get MODIS going in northern Mexico 
to install initially eight stations uh, to provide training and then also uh, to tag birds. And so, um, I, you know, as, as Mo mentioned, a, a, lot of, a lot of birds, uh, the grassland birds, are, are spending their winter in the Chihuahua Desert grasslands. Um, and that may be for up to eight months out of the year. And, and these species, because they're uh, experiencing steep population declines, really there's, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered to understand why they're declining. And so we wanna use MODIS in order to answer some key questions on grassland birds during the non-breeding period. Um, so because this is a collaborative effort, another one of our objectives is to build and strengthen partnerships in the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, in Mexico as well as uh, the US. And then we want to provide capacity and, and training um, so that we can get this off the ground and running. Um, and it's a really massive undertaking that's going to be I, fairly difficult and challenging, but also a lot of fun. Um, it's going to require a lot of communication, teamwork, and collaboration so that we can identify the common goals, the common questions, um, problem solve, leverage funding, and ultimately um, maximize our impact. Um, so uh, an upcoming example of, of some communication that'll be occurring is um, uh, a call with, uh, with RGJV where we're going to discuss common um, research questions and, and try to reduce overlap um, for the upcoming uh, uh, Neotrop um, application that's due. Um, so um, another way that we're going to accomplish this in northern Mexico is, is by having strong relationships with private landowners. Um, much of the land in northern Mexico is privately owned, and so to install these MOTA stations, um, we, we need to have partners that have relationships with landowners. And so groups like um, IMC Vida Silvestre and Pro Natura Noreste, who work in the region with private landowners, are going to be key partners uh, to make this happen. Um, there's probably other opportunities that we aren't even aware of. Um, maybe we can install MOTA stations on Kanagua um, weather, weather stations. So there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, we're also going to accomplish our goals by holding workshops in Mexico um, that will be focused on how to use MODIS equipment, how to install it, um, and how to maintain it. Um, and then we'll also have workshops specifically on um, grassland bird capture and tagging in Mexico. Um, and then, of course, to implement this, we need to establish stations and tag birds in grasslands. And so I mentioned we have uh, funding for eight stations currently, um, but of course we, we uh, anticipate um, getting money to do a lot more. Um, and so what are some of the key questions? Um, Matt mentioned that there's uh, a lot of nomadic movements on the wintering grounds. Um, seven winters of radio tracking sparrows and pipits in the Chihuahuan Desert grasslands has shown that winter survival is really low and site persistence is very low as well. So basically these birds move a lot. Um, whether they're moving long distances or just you know, a few kilometers away, we don't know. Um, why are they moving? When they move, are they searching out optimal habitat? Are they surviving when they move? And so all of these are questions we want to answer with, with MODIS. Um, and then, of course, I think MODIS will help us identify priority sites within grasslands um, in the Chihuahuan Desert. So we, we have uh, areas called grassland priority conservation areas. Um, but within those areas, are there priority ranches? Um, and what habitat are these birds honing in on um, when they're on the wintering grounds? Um, I foresee that there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration with waterfowl and wetlands researchers in the area. Um, an example of this is um, Laguna Santiago, which is uh, a large wetland in the state of Durango. And um, there's a lot of efforts there with waterfowl. However, um, it's also an area that uh, harbors large numbers of long spurs and Sprague's pipits during the winter. So this is just one of many opportunities that I foresee um, where we can have some overlap and, and maximize our impact. Of course, there's going to be a lot of challenges and barriers to success. Um, we want to hold these workshops uh, and, and they really do require some in-person interaction. And so how are we going to navigate this uh, in the era of, of COVID? Do we put them off? Do we hold them online? Um, transporting equipment and buying equipment in Mexico is going to be challenging. You know, we can only transport so much across the border. Um, there's oftentimes uh, hefty taxes associated with bringing uh, equipment into Mexico. Uh, we want to make sure that we have all of the materials on MODIS and the equipment in Spanish as well as in English. 
Um, and then we have to identify safe and secure locations for the stations. We want to make sure that the solar panels, the batteries, the sensor stations are locked up and secure, that someone has their eye on them, that the, the wind um, that is very prevalent in these grasslands isn't going to knock them over. Um, and then there's also the challenge of, of um, working with migratory birds in Mexico and getting bans on them. So um, there isn't a standard banding system in Mexico. And so if we're to, to be using USGS bans, um, you know, we have to make sure we have uh, um, banding permits and people who can uh, make sure this happens in Mexico uh, while following the, the regulations. And so, um, you know, we don't have a lot of experience working in, in Canada, but I I think there are probably a lot of opportunities out there and untapped resources. So, um, you know, these grasslands are strongholds for species like birds and um, bird sparrows and Sprague's pipits. So, um, how do we uh, get stations up in Canada and maximize our impact to to um, to study these species? Um, and so that's all I have to say about that. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll have some fun discussion related to it. Okay, awesome. Thanks, everybody. We are, um, we've now covered the entire country, US, east to west, <laughs> which is great, um, but it's a lot to think about. I just have really enjoyed seeing these planned station maps and how they're kind of um, creeping across the country. So hopefully we'll be able to plug into that as we move forward. Um, so next what we have planned is a round robin of introductions, but I know we just had a lot of information from all of our speakers. So I thought Aaron Youngberg um, might be able to synthesize some of the questions and awesome conversation that's been going on in the chat box and address anything um, major that's still unanswered. Um, sure. Uh, a lot of people are answering things in line um, with the chat box because we have a lot of folks, you know, in this webinar that have a lot of knowledge. Um, but for folks that aren't watching the chat, um, there's cost questions about how much um, a station costs, and I'm sure that's going to be uh, situationally dependent. Um, but somebody asked about how much does a base station cost yearly, um, and is there a cost for each data download? Um, and there was an answer that uh, there's no immediate effort. Let's see, hang on. There is a couple questions in there, sorry. Um, Base stations will likely always be required a cost of two to four thousand dollars on the low end and up to ten thousand dollars on the high end. No annual fee for data uploads. And you can look at uh, the modus.org website for uh, the collaboration policy there. Um, so yeah, people were saying initial setup around two thousand dollars. And then um, there's questions about the workshops. And due to COVID, we can't have a lot of in-person workshops right now. There is uh, one in November being offered by Powder Mill. Um, and so Lisa posted a link to that in the chat. And I'm going to copy the whole chat as well and send that to everyone because there's a lot of great links in there. But um, we're also going to try to do some virtual workshops, but probably not in-person ones until next year. So I wanted to answer that. And then there was a question about, will anything um, structure-wise or other otherwise interfere with an antenna signal. And um, I didn't know if somebody wanted to field that one, Matt, perhaps about structure interference with signal. Actually, I think Amy McDonald answered that fairly well. She's, uh, she works for Birds Canada for MODIS exactly. And yeah, there is the possibility of interference from any kind of structure. Um, because radio works uh, line of sight, topography, vegetation, all kinds of things affect radio signals. And so lots of things can affect, uh, can, can cause interference, but you can test a site before you place a station there uh, using some of the equipment to find out if there's extensive noise or if there's lots of interference. And um, oftentimes you're able to overcome any kind of interference simply by re-aiming an antenna or something like that. Um, and it's, it's very rare that one site specifically is just gonna be so noisy that you can't place a station there. But yeah, I could talk more about that for hours. We'll do a whole webinar about interference. How about that? <laughs> All right. Okay, great. Um, and then there was a quick question during Strasser's 
presentation about when you when you say Mexico, do you mean literally Mexico or does the Mexico Arizona border side count? Yeah, no, we're we're gonna get um we're gonna get stations up in tag birds in New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas as well. Um, I was speaking specifically to the work that we're gonna be doing in Mexico since um, that's funded a little bit differently from our uh, the funding that we're using to get kind of the network going in general. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit more challenging to get money to get stations up specifically in Mexico. So um, we'll have more discussions related to funding later on and then in a subsequent webinar, but yeah, Arizona and New Mexico are um, are key places where we want to get stations up in tech birds. Sweet. I saw also, I'll speak, since I'm unmuted now, I'll speak to, um, I see somebody brought up um, if there's negative impacts to be aware of regarding tagging the birds. Um, with grassland birds, as they are spending time in dense vegetation, oftentimes there is, uh, there can be more of a risk of, of a tag getting snagged. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing some of the testing um, with, with birds that we've tagged here in, um, in Colorado. Um, but we've, we've deployed um, over 1600 uh, radio tags on Baird's, grasshopper sparrows, and Sprague's pipits. And we've seen actually very um, low impacts um, from the tags on the birds. But yeah, they can sometimes get snagged and then escape out of the tag. Um, and we have had, I think, maybe two occurrences where a bird was entangled and, and died. But um, that's just the risk that comes with, with tagging birds in general. There was also a great question here from Jeff Bennett about what's the ideal spacing between sites. And uh, I just saw that Matt Webb answered that too, that we're hoping to get at that question with our drone testing, but about 20 to 30 miles between MODIS sites, stations. Again, it's gonna be interesting. One of the reasons we're doing this testing is because these birds spend so much time on the ground and a lot more researchers are studying birds that are you know, perched in shrubs or trees. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons we're really interested in doing that. I'll just mention also that as we talk more about our drone testing and figuring out the actual tolerance for, um, you know, where MODIS stations are picking up um, different kinds of tags and in different kinds of landscapes, a lot of people have br brought up drone work. And so um, I think there's a real opportunity for collaboration there, even across the different collaborative efforts that are happening across the U.S. So if you guys are doing um, drone testing or you think that that might be something that's within your scope or you're interested in learning more, please um, do contact Aaron Strasser. Maybe we can even have like a subgroup for um, for drone testing for MODIS stations because I think it's something where we could pull a lot of minds together and a lot of data together and get a really good information by landscape to understand how to place MODIS stations a little bit better as all of these um, stations are implemented. So um, with that, you know, keep chatting on the, on the chat I think it's really good and there's a lot of answers um, to questions coming up kind of organically, but we should really move on. I think if anything, I just want to make sure that we go through and we're going to attempt um, introductions. So I'll share a slide um, for what I'd like everyone to kind of cover on their introductions. Um, we They did this, um, Mary helped forward this through the Western Working Group for PIF and I thought it was really helpful to understand all of the um, players who are interested in working um, together in this GPCD collaborative. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, but also if you guys could now take the chance, if you have the ability to share um, your video, that would be really great so we can see your faces. Um, and then what I'll do is go, by one, go one by one and um, call you out as you kind of are appearing on my screen. And um, for sake of time, I'm going to skip people that have already presented here because um, they've already had a chance to introduce themselves. So. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. <laughs> okay, so I'll call out participants one by one. Um, when your name is called, please unmute yourself. Otherwise, please keep yourself muted. And then if you could share briefly your name and affiliation, of course, um, and then are you currently implementing MODIS in your work? If so, where? And if not, are you interested in getting started in the GPCD? And then also, if you're just here to learn more, that's totally fine. So you can just say that. And then when you're done, please remute yourself. And um, remember, we're trying to get through roughly 90 people in 30 minutes. So brief is great. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then I will start, okay. All of the Bird Conservancy people have already presented. Um, so we'll start with Jeremy Ross. Could you please unmute yourself and introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm at the University of Oklahoma. I'm a professor in the Oklahoma Biological Survey. Uh, I see some familiar places, uh, people out there, some of whom I owe an email to. Uh, but I uh, am getting involved with MODIS in Oklahoma. We uh, also have a grant through NIFWIF to expand the network here, and particularly interested in uh, wintering bird movement and survival, and perhaps linking that up to radar aeroecology as well here on the Great Plains. So looking to fill that big, huge gap uh, that is Oklahoma. Awesome. Thank you. Um, next, Tim O'Connell. Hey, this is Tim O'Connell. I'm an uh, associate professor at Oklahoma State University, and uh, I've already started an email to Jeremy, so we can start talking because we have real similar uh, interests. And that is, uh, yeah, trying to fill this gap in, in Oklahoma. Uh, one of the things that I think would be really interesting uh, from my university would be our network of research stations all across the state offers opportunities, perhaps, perhaps for stations. Uh, so thanks very much. This has been very informative. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Um, next is Leonardo Chapa Vargas. Hi, uh, Leonardo Chapa. I work for EPC, which is a research center in San Luis Potosí, uh, which is in the southern part, southern, southernmost part of the Chihuahuan deserts. And we don't have a modus station, but uh, we will be more than happy to collaborate and to learn and to set up a station. We have uh, grassland sites where we have already trapped and banded some wintering birds. Thank you for the invitation. Great, thank you. Um, next is Christina Francois. Hi, I'm Christina Francois. Um, I am the director of the Appleton Wattell Research Ranch of the National Audubon Society. We are in the Grassland Valley right in between the Huachuca Mountains and the Santa Rita Mountains in Southeast Arizona. We are excited and interested to learn about a station. We are just slow going at it so far. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Great, thank you. Uh, next is Connor Gendro. Yes, good morning. <clears throat> uh, Connor Jandro, I'm the conservation coordinator for the California Central Coast Joint Venture. Um, it's an emerging joint venture uh, in part supported by the American Bird Conservancy, uh, Cal Poly, and, and a few other uh, major partners. And we're uh, looking at exploring um, kind of a vision for the joint venture and including uh, MODIS as a potential in our uh, emerging research uh, agenda. And so just gathering information and intel on, on what and how we might be able to uh, engage in that conversation. Great, thank you. Um, David Bode. Hi everyone, I'm David Borre. I work for Pronatoa Noreste in the Chihuahua Desert. I'm program director. I haven't worked with Modus yet, but I'm very excited to be here and collaborate with you in some GPCA that we work. That is Mapimi in Tokyo by Central San Janos. And we are starting a project together with the Dr. Martin Pereda in Malpais and Cuchillo de la Sarca. And also we have worked in Santiago Lagoon too with waterfalls. So I'm very happy to be here and here for, for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Barry Robinson. Uh, yeah, my name is Barry Robinson. I'm a land bird biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service based out of Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, my job is to monitor grassland bird populations throughout the prairie provinces of Canada uh, to estimate status and trends of those of, of um, grassland bird species. Um, I'm not currently involved in any MODIS towers, but there's a great interest of the Canadian Wildlife Service to help with this effort uh, to expand the network throughout the Northern Great Plains. And uh, yeah, I'd love to see, uh, uh, you know, a, a electronic fence of towers across the U.S. border in the grasslands. And I have lots of ideas about where we could put them further north within Alberta and Saskatchewan that I think would be really beneficial. So 
um, yeah, I think this is great, and I really want to help spearhead uh, the Canadian side of this this initiative. Oops, excuse me, I was muted. That's the quote of 2020 is you're on mute, I think. <laughs> um, okay, next is Nancy Mahoney. I think you're on mute, Nancy. <laughs> there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm Nancy Mahoney. I also work out of uh, Edmonton, Alberta for the federal government for Environment and Climate Change Canada in our Wildlife Research Division. Um, like Barry, I'm very excited to uh, work on the Canadian side uh, of building this network. I did a bit of MODIS work on the west coast of Canada near Vancouver and some of the first stations there on a swallow project, so I have some familiarity. But right now my my research is in southern Alberta, looking at demography of grassland birds and migratory connectivity. Um, my focal species are uh, horned larks and chestnut collared longspurs. Um, so I've got some geolocators out on horned larks, but man, they're hard to catch and catch again. So having to only catch them once would be wonderful. Uh, and to get the information on where they're spending the rest of the year would be great. So um, Barry and I and the rest of the Canadian folks will definitely be talking about how we can get further involved. Oh, I'm muted again. Okay, Jeff Bennett is next. <laughs> Hi everybody, it's um, Jeff Bennett. I'm a conservation delivery specialist with the Rio Grande Joint Venture. I'm based in Alpine, Texas, and we're involved with a lot of grassland and uh, riparian area restoration and uh, interested in monitoring for those projects. So I'm not sure what the in store for us, but certainly interested in learning more. Great, thank you. Um, next is Dan Kim. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Kim. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in uh, South Dakota Field Research Station. I'm an avian ecologist and pollinator biologist and looking to uh, get some stations up in uh, South Dakota. Uh, nothing current, but uh, trying to investigate some funding opportunities. Great, thank you. Um, next is Courtney um, Duchard. I apologize if that's not a good pronunciation. No worries, no, people <laughs> usually don't get it. Uh, so my name is Courtney Ducart. Uh, I am going to be joining uh, faculty at Oklahoma State um, in the spring. So I've talked to Tim O'Connell about some opportunities there. I have a little bit of experience uh, collaborating with uh, BCR and specifically Allie Pierce, who's also on here, uh, trying to, uh, not with MODA specifically, but trying to tag a few mountain plovers in um, northeastern uh, Wyoming. And I'm generally really interested across the Great Plains in kind of that nomadism or what we perceive as nomadism, uh, like moving across and the variability from year to year in where birds are, so. Great, thank you. Uh, Jeff Ball. Yeah, hi folks, I'm the uh, manager of the Non-Game Migratory Bird Program for the Canadian Wildlife Service and Prairie Region. Uh, we do operate some stations in this region, primarily targeting shorebirds at uh, important stopover areas. Uh, we normally do that through partners. Uh, we do have access to funds. I'm more interested in uh, strategic deployment of those towers, so, and tags, I should say. So I'm here to learn more about uh, MODIS strategies going forward. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Amy McDonald. Hi everyone, I'm Amy. I work for Birds Canada in British Columbia, so I'm working on Western Canada MODIS projects. Um, we're getting a new project going, expanding the MODIS network in the Fraser Estuary in the Vancouver area, uh, and we're going to be working on studying shorebird movement. Um, and then we're in the early planning stages of expanding the MODIS network into the Peace region in Northern BC, 
to support some collaborators tagging projects in the future on both bats and boreal birds. Um, but that's just in the very early stages at the moment. So working on expanding MODIS in, in British Columbia. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Philip Boyd. Hi, I'm Philip Boyd. I'm the Director of Science and Communications for the Dixon Water Foundation. Um, I live in far west Texas in Marfa, and we have a couple ranches across Texas, one of which is in the Marfa grasslands in the Chihuahuan Desert. We're involved in a lot of um, research and monitoring with birds on our ranches, and uh, I'm just basically here to learn more about MODIS and see if we can be involved. Awesome, thank you. Um... Martin Pereira. Uh, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for the invitation to this webinar. I am professor here in the University of Durango. Uh, we work in the grassland birds here in the Chihuahuan Desert. And we are as excited and interested in any collaboration for the MOTUS station. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Luke George. All right. Sorry. Um, hey, everybody. I was just writing a note because I thought I'd have to jump off. Um, I'm a uh, adjunct professor at Colorado State University, and uh, I'm working on a, a drone platform for a MODIS receiver. So kind of opposite of what Matt's doing, where he's putting a tag on a drone and flying it out to see how far they can pick it up. We want to use a drone to fly and pick up tags tag birds. We've been working with uh, Bird Conservancy and have a, a prototype that works. We are able to find a grasshopper sparrow out at uh, Soapstone Prairie that kind of fell off of their radar. And uh, even though we're developing it here at uh, Colorado State, our plan is to use it for research in Nevada, where we're looking at bird movements relative to uh, global warming and canyons there. But it's a, it's a technology that could be applied to a lot of situations. Right now we're working on um, kind of refining the antennas so that we can uh, find, you know, identify where birds are located in a little bit smaller area and, um, you know, identify locations to a, a higher degree than you can with just a, a MODIS tower. Awesome, thanks Luke. Um, Andy Boyce. Hey everyone, uh, I'm coming to you from a noisy uh, coffee house in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, yeah, my name is Andy Boyce. I work for the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. Um, I run an avian grassland avian ecology research program in north central Montana. Uh, we partner with folks like the American Prairie Reserve and also the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. And um, we are planning to set up an array of eight to 10 MODIS towers in the region across about 2 million acres and to place tags on Briggs pivots and potentially chestnut colored long spurs for the next few years to study um, migratory ecology, demography, and dispersal. So happy to be on board and thanks for the invite. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Mika. Hi everyone, my name is Mika Titula. I'm a research scientist with the Borderlands Research Institute at Soro State University in Alpine, Texas, and I'm also a professor at the University of Chihuahua in Mexico, uh, which is where I'm based. And um, I work on grass and birds in the Chihuahuan Desert on both sides of the border, so I'm just uh, here to learn more and very interested to help and collaborate somehow. Great, thank you. Um, Alberto Macias Duarte. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Alberto Macias Duarte. I'm a professor at Sonora State University. I have been working with uh, Chihuahuan Desert Grasslands for 20 years now. Uh, and regarding telemetry, I've been working mostly on satellite telemetry, but I am really interested in using the MODIS technology to answer some relevant questions such as how the gra wintering grassland birds populations are gonna survive in the changing environment of the Chihuahuan Desert. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, Francisco Puente. 
Hello, I'm Francisco Puente from Organización Vida Silvestre. It's a non-profit organization. And actually we have three projects, active projects of Neotropical Migratory Beards. And we have a, a network with uh, some natural areas and land, hour, land owners and universities. And we have a big, big group of, of working in the Chihuahua and desert. So it's a place to collaborate with you. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Um, Gita Bodner. You are still muted, I think. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Just a minute to find that mute button. It hides. <laughs> All right. I'm uh, Gita Bodner. I'm a biologist um, based in Arizona. I am currently the uh, lands program director for um, Arizona. So that includes desert and grassland initiatives. It includes the lands that we own and manage, as well as uh, other lands that we collaborate on. Um, we do not have any MODIS um, systems up now or uh, specific plans for deploying them, but we are really eager to explore how we might be able to leverage the scope of the lands that we own and manage, the staff on those lands, um, uh, at least in the sort of um, Sky Islands region and potentially across the West if we can bring some other TNC folks in other state chapters um, uh, on board. Awesome, thank you. And um, I'm sorry to report that I'm gonna have to cut this off in about five minutes. So I'm gonna get through as many people as possible, but then I'm, we're also gonna assign homework to you all, which includes um, sending your study species int of interest, um, study areas of interest and any planned stations um, to different, represent different representatives at Bird Conservancy so we can keep moving this collaborative effort forward. So um, we'll get through as many more people as we can in the next five minutes and then we'll kind of, um, change change trajectories a little bit. Next is Kathy Granillo or Granillo. Granillo, por favor. <laughs> uh, my name is Kathy Granillo. I am the refuge manager at Sevieta National Wildlife Refuge in central New Mexico. Um, I've been here about 11 years and I've been doing wintering grassland bird work. We're right where the short grass prairie meets the Chihuahuan desert, Chihuahua desert grasslands and I uh, did a, about four years of work on grassland uh, migration and wintering birds. And we've picked up baird sparrows wintering here. We have usually pretty good numbers of long spurs. We have sprags pipits as well. Um, so we have some pretty cool stuff going on. Would love to get some uh, modus up and running here. Um, and so just really interested trying to figure out how we can tie into this whole system. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, Anne McKellar, McKellar, excuse me. Hi, I'm Anne McKellar. I'm with the Canadian Wildlife Service um, in Saskatchewan, Canada. I'm a waterbird and shorebird biologist, and I've been working with MODIS since about 2014 or 2015. We have um, mostly for shorebird um, migration studies. Uh, we have one tower that we run up in northern Manitoba on Hudson Bay, and then about each year anywhere from six to ten towers in southern Saskatchewan where we've been um, along with um, partners at the University of Saskatchewan um, in particular Dr. Christy Morrissey and our students we've been looking at um, shorebird migration in the mid-continent and um, stopover duration and, and other things at um, important stopover sites in Saskatchewan. So I'm interested in seeing um, yeah how the network uh, continues to develop. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Allison Fetterman. Hi, I'm Allison Fetterman. I work for the, the Northeast MODIS Collaboration um, and I act as the project coordinator um, working with landowners and site planning. Um, as you mentioned, as you saw earlier with Lisa Kijuk, um, we have stations in all over the Northeast and we're continue to expand through New England. I'm happy to see this reaching so far west. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Seth Gallagher. Hey, good morning, Seth Gallagher, uh, Director for Grassland and Mountain West Programs for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, based out of Fort Collins. Um, we're funding some MODIS work now through a number of different programs. 
and really looking forward to the results and how it can help us pinpoint our conservation effort uh, in the future. Thanks. Thanks, Seth. Uh, Dale Turner. Hi, Dale Turner with the Nature Conservancy in Arizona. Um, like my colleague, Gita Bodner, um, interested in seeing if we can leverage Nature Conservancy lands in Arizona. Um, I'm particularly interested in uh, <clears throat> north-south migration, neotropical migrants across the border here in Arizona. Um, also interested in um, Colorado River Delta um, and uh, the shorebird migrants through that part of the world. So we don't have any MODA stations yet, but we're certainly exploring this. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you. Um, Kirsten Neff. Hi everyone, I'm Kirsten Neff uh, with National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Seth's colleague in Colorado. I um, manage our Southwest Rivers program, which is funding some grassland restoration work in uh, West Texas and New Mexico. So excited to, to learn from MODIS and apply that to our grant making. Great, thanks. Uh, Adam Smith. Greetings and salutations from Georgia. I'm an ecologist with the National Wildlife Refuge System in the Southeast. Um, and I'm just here to be supportive of this. I've, I've built and installed and maintained about 20 MODIS stations on refuges in the Southeast and deployed tags on everything from songbirds to shorebirds to raptors. So I just want to be a resource and commiserate with those who are, you know, struggling through it. So feel free to click on any of those dots in, in the southeast coastal area and you'll probably find my contact information. So just want to support it. Great, thank you. We will take the support. <laughs> um, let's see, Julian Garcia Walter. Hi everybody, I'm Julian. Um, I'm a Mexican biologist and a doctoral student at the University of South Carolina. So here in Mexico, I coordinate the expansion of Coastal Motus Network, which still doesn't exist, but it will exist soon. <laughs> and this is in collaboration, very close collaboration with Pranatura Noroeste and seven other partners of the region. So we're pretty much just waiting for the components to uh, be available. It's a bit of an issue to get them across the border, but once that's done, we'll get started. And we we'll are also working on organizing a training workshop for in Spanish language. So. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. And I think the last person is Allie Bird. Hey, um, I work with the Environmental Resilience Institute at Indiana University. So we're on the Eastern edge of your efforts here, but I wanted to see how we could fit in. We have three towers just outside of Bloomington and shout out to a couple of people on here who have responded to my, my, um, my, request on the listserv when I've, you know, been at my wits end. And then I've seen names of people that wrote back and called me down and gave me advice. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I'm going to have to stop there. I apologize for those of you that did not get to introduce yourselves in person. Um, but we'll cover, you know, kind of your assignments before the next webinar. And um, that includes, again, the introduction. So we'll certainly um, get you on the list and, um, you know, include everybody in all future communications. Um, so the other thing that we wanted to touch base on on this webinar is basically, you know, um, prioritization um, and strategic planning for the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert region. And that's a bear. And I think we can um, kind of approach it a couple different ways. Um, and I think the way we're going to do it is kind of step-by-step um, -step, um, process. And so in our teams thinking about how to start that, we always came back to where is everybody working and where are they interested in working and how do we kind of collate that information efficiently. Um, and what we came up with was what we're calling the KML project. So I'll go through very quickly um, what we'd like you guys to send us information wise and um, hopefully we can get some good information on how to move forward collaboratively. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again, let's see. Okay. So for those of you that don't get my whack-a-mole reference, this is um, 
<laughs> a commonly played game for children's of the, children of the 80s and probably before and after as well, where you're trying to figure out where to put your effort, you know, and it sometimes seems to be a moving target. Um, so let's see. I don't want to be on the question slide. I want to be at the beginning of this. Here we go. Take two. All right, so how exactly do we get from, you know, interest, generally speaking, in certain locations to a prioritized plan across um, a three trinational region like the GPCD? Um, well, there's a couple different ways to go about it. And so you see here our geolocator map on the left. And how do we get from that general area of interest to, okay, this is where we put a station. Um, I think there's a lot of stations already planned and we've learned about a lot of that from the presenters already. So um, for stations that are already planned, can you please send those locations to Matt, um, Matt Webb, and we'll share his um, contact info. It's already been shared in the chat box and we'll share it at the end of the webinar. And then Matt will also be sending a follow-up um, email to share all of this assigned homework as well. Um, but I think first and foremost, super low hanging fruit, we gotta understand where stations are already planned um, so we can coordinate in setting up future stations based on that. Um, these locations will be collated um, by Matt and then shared with Mary. I know Mary touched upon the um, Google map that she's maintaining for planned stations. Um, we also have one that we use just for internal purposes at Bird Conservancy. So if you send those planned locations to Matt, um, then he'll work with Mary to get it uploaded on her map and ours as well. Um, so, you know, I think probably a lot of us are also wondering, for those of us that have funding um, to put stations out, we, you know, at Bird Conservancy, we're sitting on funding for roughly 40 stations to kind of tackle grassland bird migration and filling some of those knowledge gaps. Um, but we don't know exactly where to place them. Um, we think the general position should probably be an arrangement to answer a certain research question, but ideally um, this will benefit the collaborative as well. So some low hanging fruit that, um, Aaron Strasser talked a little bit about is, um, you know, collaborating with shorebird biologists. I think there's a lot of room for collaboration there and placing stations that are of interest for migratory shorebirds as well as grassland birds. So that's just an example of where placing a station in a certain location could benefit multiple projects. Um, so this is where the KML project comes in. So what is a KML? A KML is a spatial data file that's fairly easily created in Google Earth. Um, we have a link to instructions for how to create KMLs for those of you that are new to that kind of um, data creation, and we'll share that as part of the um, notes. Matt, could you just share that link um, in, the, in the notes section here? And then we will also include it in the follow-up email as a result of this webinar. Um, so we'd like to ask anyone who has an area of interest where they potentially would like to put a MODIS station, um, please send a polygon. So not lines or points, but just a general area of interest to Erin Youngberg. And that's her email address right there. Um, and then the text of the email, please include your study species and a short research description. Again, in the text of the email, not in the KML file. Um, and as far as just a little bit of guidance for this um, KML file, we're just looking for general areas of interest. Um, so for example, the area of coverage generally for a MODIS station, if you believe it, is 700 square miles. So if you think about, you know, you take the 15 mile radius, um, that's generally, you know, kind of thrown around as how far out um, one MODIS station can detect a tagged bird, and you multiply that out, um, you get a very large area of impact for one MODIS station. So if you can just send really, you know, general polygons um, to Matt, then we hope that as we overlay these polygons, this is an example gray polygon right here, um, we'll start to see areas of concentra concentration of interest and then be able to place stations or tax <laughs> um, in those areas. And so how this would play out in the GPCD or hope we, uh, what we hope will happen is that, um, you know, as we start overlaying these areas of interest, um, where stations are needed across multiple projects will kind of become clearer to us. Um, so the, the plan with that generally is to collect that information and then collate it and then present it in webinar number two of this webinar series and then move forward on how to prioritize areas. Um, we all also recognize that, you know, research questions also need to be prioritized. This isn't just a, a question of where do we put stations, it's um, how do we prioritize um, questions that need answering. And so we're gonna be tackling that in webinar number two, but we thought first it would be really helpful to have the spatial data um, from people on this call and um, in the collaborative, generally speaking. 
So I know this says questions, but I'll ask you to hold questions until the end so we just so we can get through all of the topics that we're hoping to cover. Um, the other thing that we wanted to touch upon, oops, excuse me, um, is upcoming funding opportunities. Again, in addition to the prioritization in webinar two, we'll also like to talk um, more in depth about funding opportunities that we could approach collaboratively, but there are a couple things coming up in the next couple months that we just wanted to um, put on everybody's radar. Um, Specifically, the a Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act, or NMBCA, and Strasser, Aaron Strasser um, heads those up for Bird Conservancy, along with Arvind Punjabi, who um, often apply, or applies with us, um, and we have joint applications. So, Aaron, would you like to talk a little bit more about um, the NMBCA opportunity and um, deadlines for that? Yeah, so... Um... All right, so the deadline for, for these applications is um, November 5th. Um, so uh, there's funding up to $200,000 uh, per project, but um, there is a heavy match requirement. So a three to one match requirement. And so um, we've managed to, to, to get this funding to do a lot of um, on the ground work in Mexico, um, monitoring uh, winter survival of grassland birds. And that's answered a lot of our questions that have led to more questions that we think will be um, answered uh, via MODIS. So, um, you know, it's, it's a hefty application, but, um, you know, these types of projects uh, go a lot further when you're collaborating with, with other partners. And so there's various entities, organizations um, in Mexico and, and the U.S. and Canada that are focused on um, getting funds through NMBCA to do work in, in the Chihuahuan Desert. And so, um, yeah, we're excited to collaborate with you guys on potentially upcoming um, proposals that'll focus on MODIS and, and allow us for some overlap. Awesome. And I know the RGJV is going to be spearheading kind of some of that collaboration um, on the NMBCA applications. So mm -hmm. uh, we can kind of uh, look to that as well for opportunities to overlap. But again, we'll have a more extended funding conversation in webinar two. Um, and then uh, the other bullet I have here is other pockets of money that we're not currently aware of. Um, but again, I'll just ask you to save comment on that until the very end. Okay, so the important part, homework. Um, next steps. So can you please send your study area polygons or your KML files as well as your study species in research description to Erin Youngberg. Again, that's her email address right there. And as a reminder, please send this planned station points um, to Matt Webb. Um, we have a couple next steps already planned. One is a synopsis of this webinar um, in Espanol, and that'll be happening the week of September 21st. So um, in our initial call for attendees here, we added um, the option to or basically the option to ask for a Spanish language um, synopsis of this webinar. So we'll be contacting those that expressed interest directly. But if you also would be interested in that synopsis, please email Aaron Strasser directly. Um, secondarily, I've mentioned this a couple times, but we'll be having webinar number two, ideally the week of November 16th. Um, and we hope to present a draft of the spatial prioritization plan based on the KMLs that we get from you all um, and talk about next steps for placing individual stations. Um, have some big picture thinking discussion um, for research questions, funding in the next two-ish years, and then um, thinking about a process for adding new collaborators and projects. And I'll just say that webinar two will be much more discussion-based, um, so we wanted to really set the scene here in context so everyone had it, and it's recorded for those of you, um, for those that weren't able to attend today, and then we can move forward in planning from there. Um, and then final mention, just MODIS in the time of COVID, it's hard and it's a moving target, more whack-a-mole. Um, so I think we really just kind of need to be patient. Um, one thing we can talk about next time is timelines for workshops. And I'm interested in looking at the virtual workshop resource that Powder Mill um, has mentioned um, to see if that's a viable option. Um, but we have several, um, we have support for, I believe, four um, workshops across the GPCD region. But how we're going to implement those next year um, will really depend partially on how COVID progresses over the next couple months. Um, and just to note that implementation abroad and in the U.S. will likely be affected by this. I know some of the speakers that we had already, um, you know, have mentioned this, but we'll just need to be flexible as we move forward, especially in international planning. 
Um, and with that, I just want to thank you again for taking the time out of your day. It's, um, it was a quick two hours um, from my perspective, but I can open up now for questions. And for those of you that need to hop off the webinar, thank you very much for coming. And Matt Webb will be sending a follow-up email reminding you of your homework. And we hope, hopefully we'll see you in November. All right. A lot of folks have introduced themselves in the chat too, so I encourage people to do that and I'll save that chat and we'll send a transcript of that with a follow-up email to everybody as well. Awesome, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks Mo. It'd be a good no idea problem. to save that <laughs> chat before the yeah, I don't, meeting is, uh, is ended, otherwise it disappears. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone for attending. Yeah, I really think this chat is gonna be super helpful. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yay Zoom for letting us keep all of that. Yeah. All right, awesome. does anyone have any like per pressing questions right now that they wanted to ask um, verbally? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Okay. Hello. Oh, Sorry, Jennifer Laurie. Yep. Um, it's just a question. I'm not sure if it's possible, but for selecting a modus site location, is there any other way to test if the signal will be uh, good with any other type of device to make sure there's no interference without buying all the components of a modus station for planning? Yeah, you can. Uh, you can use a low tech receiver if you have that. Um, <laughs> You can also use uh, CTTs like handheld receiver, but you can you can essentially check using those. Um, I think we could probably figure out some way of connecting an antenna to a computer and using the Audacity program to listen for noise as well. But I've not tested that entirely. But uh, there's multiple ways. If you email me matt.web at birdconservancy.org, we can discuss that further. Okay, thank you so much, Matt. Yeah. I have a couple of quick questions. Um, yeah. Uh, so what are, what, what's the battery life now for, for these tags for, for small pass rings like on Bear Sparrow and, and the, the Long Spurs? Um, like, is it possible to get, if you tag them on the summer, wintering, or sorry, the breeding grounds, is it possible to get a return migration too, or is it just a one-way thing for birds that small? Stu, the, the answer to that quite well, the answer to all questions is it depends <laughs> um, on the, the size of the bird. So with the solar tags, your lifespan is unlimited. Um, and uh, with, uh, with battery powered tags on a Baird Sparrow, you're probably looking at six months max. Um, so it all depends on timing. If you can do it, you tag them at the right time, then you can get returns. Um, and then as soon as you get up to thrush size, even horned lark, maybe sprags pipit, you could probably get a full year tag life out of a battery tag. Um, so it's up there, but as soon as you get below Baird Sparrow size, you know, you're in the three to six months, month range, which makes it a little trickier to, to plan. Right. So for those smaller species, I think it'd be really important that we put a bunch of tags out in, in the wintering grounds as well. So we have sort of the boat directions. Yeah, you got to hit a often two pronged approach or uh, like late season tagging efforts, which aren't always straightforward. Yeah. Uh, and then the other question I had was, and I think this might have been mentioned, but just um, if you don't have, if you can't, you know, you have a great place or place you want to put a tower, but there's no cellular, cellular coverage or internet, which I think is going to be the case for a lot of places in, in extreme southern Alberta and, and uh, Saskatchewan. Um, the only option there is, yeah, someone has to physically go and upload, grab the data every once in a while. That's right, yeah. Um, and the stations, uh, I think CTT sensor stations are 16 gigabyte. The, the file size for the data that's collected on those is pretty small. It's all small text, um, text files or, or CSV files. And so you could, you could hold probably seasons worth of data on one of these stations. Um, so I wouldn't worry about the uh, station becoming overloaded with data and so you can really just send texts out you know as often as you would like to collect the data to 
uh, download from that. But yeah, that's the the only other option. But not a major limitation that if there's lots of storage space. Yeah. Because you're probably visiting the sites to maintain the towers anyways, right? So. Yep. Yeah. To make sure that it's still working, solar panels and all that. So yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So I, I have a question about the testing of the ranges. Um, uh, Aaron, uh, have, have, has it come up like using proxies for the bird? Because one thing that we've talked about with um, kind of the, the radar antenna people here is uh, the experts is, is that the actual bird itself has conductive properties to it. Um, what are you guys using? And uh, have you, have you played around with that? Like hot dogs or whatever it might be? Hot dogs and bananas. Bananas. There's a vegetarian yeah. option. <laughs> yeah. Actually, one, Juanita here um, is a possibility too. So we might, we might put a tag on her and have her fetch. We've also talked about attaching uh, clementines or cuties um, to the actual drone and putting a tag on that as well. Mm -hmm. We use oranges. Okay, yeah, there are other people who uh, create little, you know, bodies of birds using like a saline bag or something like that. So there's lots of different potentials, uh, potential options. Because one thing that often has come up is the, is the effect of the, the air sacs and, and just the hollow bones and, and, and trying to replicate that well. So I don't know if there's been any advancements made that way or not. But Yeah, not that I know of. And while I have the floor, um, you know, state agencies, state universities, uh, we may have restrictions in place when I want to get out and put out towers. And one of the things we want to do is put out towers in Texas, which, um, you know, obviously if I, if I have to move out of state, but I'm restricted in doing so, uh, are there, I wonder if there's a list of, of partners that we could have that would be kind of like a, an emergency call of people that would really be willing to step up and check towers or maybe even help install towers. That's a, yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Sorry, Stu, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go no, ahead. you go ahead. <laughs> that's, that's actually something that um, I'm, I'm helping to install two stations at Cheyenne Bottoms uh, in Kansas, in the middle of Kansas. And that's, you know, that's something that, we can all do uh, if we have the capability or the uh, the capacity to do that kind of thing. Um, I'm happy to have that conversation and connect you with people who uh, are you know within the area that you're interested, uh, and it might be something that we can put on our radar to do over the next couple of years as well as we have um, large scale installations going on across this region. But yeah, absolutely, I think that's a really good conversation to have. The only thing I would add to that is to on the website there's a a short summary of regional sort of coordinators and the Matt's listed for you know, the Great Plains and um, on the Gulf of Mexico currently Susan Heath is um, so at least there's some local expertise so they can connect you with the the right expertise and as these you know regional efforts become more prolific there will be more and more regional expertise but we don't yet have sort of a database of where those people are it's going to take a little bit of sleuthing. Um, but starting with those main points of contact, who will know basically know who who's closest, essentially. <laughs> Tara, I think you're muted. Am I unmuted then? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm in British Columbia, Canada, and it's quite in a mountainous area uh, in the country. And I am trying to figure out where best to place towers in relation to the altitudes that birds are going to be migrating. Um, so moving away from coastal areas, but trying to do more inland tracking. And I was curious if anybody had given this any thought um, and how they were, were placing towers in sort of mountainous regions.
Just me then, okay. <laughs> well, I can say quickly in the Northeast, we work and we've been working in New York State this year in the mountains and we're moving into New England and we often use fire towers so the existing infrastructure and then um, just try and find places through aerial imagery that are accessible by roads if you can see roads and clearings um, in relation to where you think the birds are migrating through. Mm -hmm. It's not probably as high elevation as you're dealing with but <laughs> it is our goal is interior network. We were specifically aiming for that. Mm -hmm. um, Google has some valuable what's called view shed tools um, which allow you to examine shadows created by buildings or shadows created by topography um, and I don't have it at my fingertips but other people on the call or Amy or Matt can provide links to that and I think one thing that's often overlooked with mountains or hills is the is the sides everybody's eager to get to the peak um, but the sides of mountains and hills um, overlooking vistas um, are very, can be very useful. Like you have a shadow behind you, um, but you can find access on the side of a hill to overlook a valley or to overlook a vista. Um, you know, mountains are certainly a great challenge, and I don't know if there's a, you know, going to be a one size solution that fits all for for those landscapes. Um, and it takes a lot of time to drive around them and find the best spots, but. Um, and anyway, if you want to get to specifics, I'm, we're happy to help as we can. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Stu. I had uh, thought about that as well, too. I mean, most of our mountain peaks would require quite a bit of hiking to get up to them, and I'm not uh, super eager to lug Modus batteries up to the top. But uh, yeah, the sides could be, could be really important for trying to get some birds as they're moving past areas. Yeah, no, there's no, I don't think it will ever be a perfect solution that's there's always going to be trade-offs, especially in mountainness, in mountain um, skates. Yeah, I'll send you that view shed stuff, Tara. Tara and uh, I'm, something I'm, I've been thinking about, too, for the stations up in the Peace region. Um, I know one spot that was suggested to me was actually seeing if the ski hill would collaborate and getting uh, some equipment up there. So that's something I'm going to look into. Um, and then also... I've been thinking along the there's like the, along the lake up there is one thing that would at least get some open space if not height. Um, anyway, happy to happy to chat more about it. That'd be great. Thanks, Amy. You know, in, in terms of these conversations, um, you know, all of, all of this this knowledge I think is is wonderful. The one thing that I think would really help, and maybe we all have this, is uh, an example for willing to share it of permitting, like what was a successful permitting uh, process for the different, the various agencies. Um, like if there was a template that we might be able to use so that every, everybody who wanted to put up a tower might be on, might, might have the same, you know, citations and language uh, if we want to put up a tower in Na National Wildlife Refuge, and things like that. Is, is that possibly something that we all might be willing to share? Uh, as long as I don't think that it should have uh, um, you know, private information in it, I guess we could redact certain things. Yeah, I think that's something we could absolutely share um, as we cross those bridges. I know out in the Northeast, uh, both Lisa and Allison have done a lot of work uh, getting permits and that kind of thing for a lot of the locations that they've placed stations. So I have been able to get some of those uh, permit documents from them and I'm, I'm <laughs> looking both at Allison and Lisa, and I know both of you'd probably be very interested in sharing those documents too. So uh, they're, they're great resources because of their experience over the past several years um, expanding the network out there. So yeah, that's something we could you know, gather together and share too. Okay, yeah, feel great. free to share. I, I was just going to say too that um, the uh, that we use that memorandum of understanding, which was a legal document that's a landowner agreement. And happy, you're ha welcome to use whatever it, whatever you want. And I don't know the one thing that we've used throughout the Northeast is uh, our organization has an umbrella policy of a million dollars that um, 
it covers anybody working on any of the stations that we put up. And I don't know what your insurance policy, but early on, Stu said that could become important. It's just something to think about if you're going to organize all of these. You know, what happens if somebody skis into a guy line or I don't know what, what they're doing out west, you know, I, you know, ATVing, I don't know what they're doing, but, um, or snowmobiling, but it's something you should really consider, uh, which I hate to consider, but just throwing that out there. Out here. That's what's happening. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, insurance. All right, well, I think I'll wrap it up now, but this will be recorded. So um, I think in our follow-up email, we can also share how to view that. And we'll also put it on our YouTube um, channel for Bird Conservancy. So thank you all so much for coming and your participation. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing where this momentum takes us. So.